How can Axel be found when he is lost and without light in the bowels of the earth? Jules Verne, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. The vintage episode for the week is lot number 249 by Arthur Conan Doyle. Be sure to check it out on Tuesday. If you have found value in the show, please consider becoming a monthly supporter. Help us to help other folks like you. Please go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a monthly supporter today. The Treasure of the Sierra Madre by B. Traven is recorded and in post-production. This character-driven tale of greed is the inspiration of the classic film, directed by John Huston, starring Humphrey Bogart. If you're a fan of the film, you've got to pick up the audiobook. We are extending the pre-order pricing for another week. Get your pre-order in today and save $4 off the retail price. Members can use their coupon codes and save even more. A link can be found in the show notes. Or you can go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and click the appropriate button. And now, A Journey to the Center of the Earth, Part 6 of 9, by Jules Verne. Chapter 28. The Rescue in the Whispering Gallery. When I returned to partial life, My face was wet with tears. How long that state of insensibility had lasted, I cannot say. I had no means now of taking account of time. Never was solitude equal to this. Never had any living being been so utterly forsaken. After my fall, I had lost a good deal of blood. I felt it flowing over me. Oh, how happy I should have been I could have died and if death were not yet to be gone through, I would think no longer. I drove away every idea, and conquered by my grief, I rolled myself to the foot of the opposite wall. Already I was feeling the approach of another faint, and was hoping for complete annihilation, when a loud noise reached me. It was like the distant rumble of continuous thunder, and I could hear its sounding undulations rolling far away into the remote recesses of the abyss. Whence could this noise proceed? It must be from some phenomenon proceeding in the great depths amidst which I lay helpless. Was it an explosion of gas? Was it the fall of some mighty pillar of the globe? I listened still. I wanted to know if the noise would be repeated. A quarter of an hour passed away. Silence reigned in this gallery. I could not hear even the beating of my heart. Suddenly my ear, resting by chance against the wall, caught, or seemed to catch, certain vague, indescribable, distant, articulate sounds, as of words. This is a delusion, I thought but it was not. Listening more attentively, I heard in reality a murmuring of voices, but my weakness prevented me from understanding what the voices said. Yet it was language, I was sure of it. For a moment I feared the words might be my own, brought back by the echo. Perhaps I had been crying out, unknown to myself. I closed my lips firmly and laid my ear against the wall again. Yes, truly, someone is speaking. Those are words. Even a few feet from the wall, I could hear distinctly. I succeeded in catching uncertain, strange, undistinguishable words. They came as if pronounced in low, murmured whispers. The word forlorad was several times repeated in a tone of sympathy and sorrow. Help! I cried with all my might. Help! I listened. I watched in the darkness for an answer. A cry. 
a mere breath of sound, but nothing came. Some minutes passed. A whole world of ideas had opened in my mind. I thought that my weakened voice could not penetrate to my companions. It is they, I repeated. What other men can be thirty leagues underground? I again began to listen. Passing my ear over the wall from one place to another, I found the point where the voices seemed to be best heard. The word Forlorad again returned. Then the rolling thunder, which had roused me from my lethargy. No, I said. No, it is not through such a mass that a voice can be heard. I am surrounded by granite walls, and the loudest explosion could never be heard here. This noise comes along the gallery. There must be here some remarkable exercise of acoustic laws. I listened again, and this time, yes, this time I did distinctly hear my name pronounced across the wide interval. It was my uncle's own voice. He was talking to the guide, and forlorad is a Danish word. Then I understood it all. To make myself heard, I must speak along this wall, which would conduct the sound of my voice just as wire conducts electricity. But there was no time to lose. If my companions moved but a few steps away, the acoustic phenomenon would cease. I therefore approached the wall and pronounced these words as clearly as possible. Uncle Liedenbrock! I waited with the deepest anxiety. Sound does not travel with great velocity. Even increased density air has no effect upon its rate of traveling. It merely augments its intensity. Seconds, which seemed ages, passed away. And at last, these words reached me. Axel? Axel! Is it you? Yes. Yes! I replied. My boy, where are you? Lost in the deepest darkness. Where is your lamp? It is out. And the stream? Disappeared. Axel, Axel, take courage. Wait, I am exhausted. I can't answer. Speak to me. Courage, resumed my uncle. Don't speak. Listen to me. We have looked for you up the gallery and down the gallery. Could not find you. I wept for you, my poor boy. At last, supposing you were still on the Hansbach, we fired our guns. Our voices are audible to each other, but our hands cannot touch. But don't despair, Axel. It is a great thing that we can hear each other. During this time, I had been reflecting. A vague hope was returning to my heart. There was one thing I must know to begin with. I placed my lips close to the wall, saying, My uncle, my boy, came to me after a few seconds. We must know how far we are apart. That is easy. You have your chronometer? Yes. Well, take it. Pronounce my name, noting exactly the second when you speak. I will repeat it as soon as it shall come to me, and you will observe the exact moment when you get my answer. Yes, and half the time between my call and your answer will exactly indicate that which my voice will take in coming to you. Just so, my uncle. Are you ready? Yes. Now, attention, I am going to call your name. I put my ear to the wall and as soon as the name Axel came, I immediately replied, Axel, then waited. Forty seconds, said my uncle. Forty seconds between the two words, so the sound takes twenty seconds in coming. Now, at the rate of 1,120 feet in a second, this is 22,400 feet, or four miles and a quarter, nearly. Four miles and a quarter? I murmured. It will soon be over, Axel. Must I go up or down? Down, for this reason. 
we are in a vast chamber with endless galleries. Yours must lead into it, for it seems as if all the clefts and fractures of the globe radiated round this vast cavern. So get up and begin walking. Walk on. Drag yourself along if necessary. Slide down the steep places, and at the end you will find us ready to receive you. Now, begin moving. These words cheered me up. Goodbye, uncle, I cried. I'm going. There will be no more voices heard when once I have started. So, goodbye. Goodbye, Axel. Au revoir. These were the last words I heard. This wonderful underground conversation, carried on with a distance of four miles and a quarter between us, concluded with these words of hope. I thanked God from my heart, for it was He who had conducted me through those vast solitudes to the point where, alone of all others perhaps, the voices of my companions could have reached me. This acoustic effect is easily explained on scientific grounds. It arose from the concave form of the gallery and the conducting power of the rock. There are many examples of this propagation of sounds which remain unheard in the intermediate space. I remember that a similar phenomenon has been observed in many places, amongst others on the internal surface of the gallery of the Dome of St. Paul's in London and especially in the midst of the curious caverns among the quarries near Syracuse, the most wonderful of which is called Dionysius Ear. These remembrances came into my mind, and I clearly saw that since my uncle's voice really reached me, there could be no obstacle between us. Following the direction by which the sound came, of course I should arrive in his presence, if my strength did not fail me. I therefore rose. I rather dragged myself than walked. The slope was rapid, and I slid down. Soon the swiftness of the descent increased horribly and threatened to become a fall. I no longer had the strength to stop myself. Suddenly there was no ground under me. I felt myself revolving in air, striking and rebounding against the craggy projections of a vertical gallery. Quite a well! My head struck against a sharp corner of the rock, and I became unconscious. Chapter 29 Thalata, Thalata When I came to myself, I was stretched in half-darkness, covered with thick coats and blankets. My uncle was watching over me to discover the least sign of life. At my first sigh, he took my hand. When I opened my eyes, he uttered a cry of joy. He lives! He lives! he cried. Yes, I am still alive, I answered feebly. My dear nephew, said my uncle, pressing me to his breast. You are saved! I was deeply touched with the tenderness of his manner as he uttered these words, and still more with the care with which he watched over me but such trials were wanted to bring out the professor's tenderer qualities. At this moment Hans came. He saw my hand in my uncle's, and I may safely say that there was joy in his countenance. Good dark, he said. How do you do, Hans? How are you? And now, uncle, tell me where we are at the present moment. Tomorrow, Axel, tomorrow. Now you are too faint and weak. I have bandaged your head with compresses, which must not be disturbed. Sleep now, and tomorrow I will tell you all. But do tell me what time it is, and what day. It is Sunday, the 8th of August, and it is ten at night. You must ask me no more questions until the 10th. In truth I was very weak, and my eyes involuntarily closed. I wanted a good night's rest, and I therefore went off to sleep, with the knowledge that I had been four long days alone in the heart of the earth. Next morning, on awakening, 
I looked round me. My couch, made up of all our traveling gear, was in a charming grotto, adorned with splendid stalactites, and the soil of which was a fine sand. It was half light. There was no torch, no lamp, yet certain mysterious glimpses of light came from without through a narrow opening in the grotto. I heard, too, a vague and indistinct noise, something like the murmuring of waves breaking upon a shingly shore, and at times I seemed to hear the whistling of wind. I wondered whether I was awake, whether I was dreaming, whether my brain, crazed by my fall, was not affected by imaginary noises. Yet neither eyes nor ears could be so utterly deceived. It is a ray of daylight, I thought, sliding in through this cleft in the rock. That is indeed the murmuring of waves. That is the rustling noise of wind. Am I quite mistaken? Or have we returned to the surface of the earth? Has my uncle given up the expedition, or is it happily terminated? I was asking myself these unanswerable questions when the professor entered. Good morning, Axel, he cried cheerily. I feel sure you are better. Yes, I am indeed, said I, sitting up on my couch. You can hardly fail to be better, for you have slept quietly. Hans and I watched you by turns, and we have noticed you were evidently recovering. Indeed, I do feel a great deal better and I will give you a proof of that presently, if you will let me have my breakfast. You shall eat, lad. The fever has left you. Hans rubbed your wounds with some ointment, or other, of which the Icelanders keep the secret, and they have healed marvellously. Our hunter is a splendid fellow. Whilst he went on talking, my uncle prepared a few provisions, which I devoured eagerly, notwithstanding his advice to the contrary. All the while, I was overwhelming him with questions, which he answered readily. I then learnt that my providential fall had brought me exactly to the extremity of an almost perpendicular shaft, and as I had landed in the midst of an accompanying torrent of stones, the least of which would have been enough to crush me, the conclusion was that a loose portion of the rock had come down with me. This frightful conveyance had thus carried me into the arms of my uncle where I fell, bruised, bleeding, and insensible. Truly it is wonderful that you have not been killed a hundred times over. But, for the love of God, don't let us ever separate again, or we may never see each other more. Not separate? Is the journey not over, then? I opened a pair of astonished eyes, which immediately called for the question. What is the matter, Axel? I have a question to ask you. You say that I am safe and sound? No doubt you are. And are my limbs unbroken? Certainly. And my head? Your head, except for a few bruises, is all right. And it is on your shoulders, where it ought to be. Well, I am afraid my brain is affected. Your mind affected? Yes, I fear so. Are we again on the surface of the globe? No, certainly not. Well, then I must be mad. For don't I see the light of day? And don't I hear the wind blowing and the sea breaking on the shore? Ah, is that all? Do tell me all about it. I can't explain the inexplicable, but you will soon see and understand that geology has not yet learnt all it has to learn. Then let us go, I answered quickly. No, Axel, the open air might be bad for you. Open air? Yes. The wind is rather strong. You must not expose yourself. But I assure you I am perfectly well. A little patience, my nephew. A relapse might get us into trouble, and we have no time to lose, for the voyage may be a long one. The voyage? Yes. Rest today, and tomorrow we will set sail. Set sail? And I almost leaped up. What did it all mean? Had we a river? A lake? A sea to depend upon? Was there a ship at our disposal, in some underground harbor? My curiosity was highly excited. My uncle vainly tried to restrain me. 
when he saw that my impatience was doing me harm, he yielded. I dressed in haste. For greater safety, I wrapped myself in a blanket and came out of the grotto. Chapter 30 A New Mare Internum At first I could hardly see anything. My eyes, unaccustomed to the light, quickly closed. When I was able to reopen them, I stood more stupefied even than surprised. The sea! I cried. Yes, my uncle replied. The Liedenbrock Sea and I don't suppose any other discoverer will ever dispute my claim to name it after myself as its first discoverer. A vast sheet of water, the commencement of a lake or an ocean, spread far away beyond the range of the eye, reminding me forcibly of that open sea which drew from Xenophon's ten thousand Greeks after their long retreat, the simultaneous cry, Thalata, Thalata, the sea, the sea. The deeply indented shore was lined with a breadth of fine shining sand, softly lapped by the waves, and strewn with the small shells which had been inhabited by the first of created beings. The waves broke on this shore with the hollow echoing murmur peculiar to vast enclosed spaces. A light foam flew over the waves before the breath of a moderate breeze, and some of the spray fell upon my face. On this slightly inclining shore, about a hundred fathoms from the limit of the waves, came down the foot of a huge wall of vast cliffs, which rose majestically to an enormous height. Some of these, dividing the beach with their sharp spurs, formed capes and promontories, worn away by the ceaseless action of the surf. Farther on, the eye discerned their massive outline sharply defined against the hazy distant horizon. It was quite an ocean, with the irregular shores of earth, but desert and frightfully wild in appearance. If my eyes were able to range afar over this great sea, it was because a peculiar light brought to view every detail of it. It was not the light of the sun, with his dazzling shafts of brightness and the splendor of his rays nor was it the pale and uncertain shimmer of the moonbeams, the dim reflection of a nobler body of light, no. The illuminating power of this light, its trembling diffusiveness, its bright, clear whiteness, and its low temperature, showed that it must be of electric origin. It was like an aurora borealis, a continuous cosmical phenomenon, filling a cavern of sufficient extent to contain an ocean. The vault that spanned the space above, the sky, if it could be called so, seemed composed of vast planes of cloud, shifting and variable vapors, which by their condensation must at certain times fall in torrents of rain. I should have thought that under so powerful a pressure of the atmosphere there could be no evaporation, and yet, under a law unknown to me, there were broad tracts of vapor suspended in the air. But then the weather was fine. The play of the electric light produced singular effects upon the upper strata of cloud. Deep shadows reposed upon their lower wreaths, and often, between two separated fields of cloud, there glided down a ray of unspeakable luster. But it was not solar light, and there was no heat. The general effect was sad, supremely melancholy. Instead of the shining firmament, spangled with its innumerable stars, shining singly or in clusters, I felt that all these subdued and shaded lights were ribbed in by vast walls of granite, which seemed to overpower me with their weight, and that all this space, great as it was, would not be enough for the march of the humblest of satellites. Then I remembered the theory of an English captain, who likened the earth to a vast hollow sphere, in the interior of which the air became luminous because of the vast pressure that weighed upon it, while two stars, Pluto and Proserpina, rolled within upon the circuit of their mysterious orbits. We were in reality shut up inside an immeasurable excavation. Its width could not be estimated, 
since the shore ran widening as far as I could reach, nor could its length, for the dim horizon bounded the new. As for its height, it must have been several leagues. Where this vault rested upon its granite base, no eye could tell. But there was a cloud hanging far above, the height of which we estimated at twelve thousand feet, a greater height than that of any terrestrial vapor, and no doubt due to the great density of the air. The word cavern does not convey any idea of this immense space. Words of human tongue are inadequate to describe the discoveries of him who ventures into the deep abysses of earth. Besides, I could not tell upon what geological theory to account for the existence of such an excavation. Had the cooling of the globe produced it? I knew of celebrated caverns from the descriptions of travelers, but had never heard of any such dimensions as this. If the grotto of Guachara in Colombia, visited by Humboldt, had not given up the whole of the secret of its depth to the philosopher, who investigated it to the depth of 2,500 feet, it probably did not extend much farther. The immense Mammoth Cave in Kentucky is of gigantic proportions, since its vaulted roof rises 500 feet above the level of an unfathomable lake, and travelers have explored its ramifications to the extent of 40 miles. But what were these cavities compared to that in which I stood with wonder and admiration? With its sky of luminous vapors, its bursts of electric light, and a vast sea filling its bed. My imagination felt powerless before such immensity. I gazed upon these wonders in silence. Words failed me to express my feelings. I felt as if I was in some distant planet, Uranus or Neptune, and in the presence of phenomena of which my terrestrial experience gave me no cognizance. For such novel sensations, new words were wanted, and my imagination failed to supply them. I gazed, I thought, I admired, with a stupefaction mingled with a certain amount of fear. The unforeseen nature of this spectacle brought back the color to my cheeks. I was under a new course of treatment with the aid of astonishment, and my convalescence was promoted by this novel system of therapeutics. Besides, the dense and breezy air invigorated me, supplying more oxygen to my lungs. It will be easily conceived that after an imprisonment of forty-seven days in a narrow gallery, it was the height of physical enjoyment to breathe a moist air impregnated with saline particles. I was delighted to leave my dark grotto. My uncle, already familiar with these wonders, had ceased to feel surprise. You feel strong enough to walk a little way now? he asked. Yes, certainly, and nothing could be more delightful. Well, take my arm, Axel, and let us follow the windings of the shore. I eagerly accepted, and we began to coast along this new sea. On the left, huge pyramids of rock, piled one upon another, produced a prodigious titanic effect. Down their sides flowed numberless waterfalls, which went on their way in brawling but pellucid streams. A few light vapors, leaping from rock to rock, denoted the place of hot springs, and streams flowed softly down to the common basin, gliding down the gentle slopes with a softer murmur. Amongst these streams, I recognized our faithful traveling companion, the Hansbach, coming to lose its little volume quietly in the mighty sea just as if it had done nothing else since the beginning of the world. We shall see it no more, I said with a sigh. What matters, replied the philosopher, whether this or another serves to guide us? I thought him rather ungrateful. But at that moment my attention was drawn to an unexpected sight. At a distance of five hundred paces, at the turn of a high promontory, appeared a high, tufted, dense, forest. It was composed of trees of moderate height, formed like umbrellas, with exact geometrical outlines. The currents of wind seemed to have had no effect upon their shape, and in the midst of the windy blasts they stood unmoved and firm, just like a clump of petrified cedars. I hastened forward. I could not give any name to these singular creations. 
Were they some of the two hundred thousand species of vegetables known hitherto? And did they claim a place of their own in the lacustrine flora? No. When we arrived under their shade, my surprise turned into admiration. There stood before me productions of earth, but of gigantic stature, which my uncle immediately named. It is only a forest of mushrooms, said he. And he was right. Imagine the large development attained by these plants, which prefer a warm, moist climate. I knew that the Lycobodon giganteum attains, according to Bulliard, a circumference of eight or nine feet, but here were pale mushrooms thirty to forty feet high and crowned with a cap of equal diameter. There they stood in thousands. No light could penetrate between their huge cones, and complete darkness reigned beneath those giants. They formed settlements of domes placed in close array like the round, thatched roofs of a central African city. Yet I wanted to penetrate farther underneath, though a chill fell upon me as soon as I came under those cellular vaults. For half an hour we wandered from side to side in the damp shades, and it was a comfortable and pleasant change to arrive once more upon the seashore. But the subterranean vegetation was not confined to these fungi. Farther on rose groups of tall trees of colorless foliage, and easy to recognize. They were lowly shrubs of earth, here attaining gigantic size, like a podiums, a hundred feet high, the huge sigillaria, found in our coal mines, tree ferns, as tall as our fir trees in northern latitudes, lepidodendra, with cylindrical forked stems, terminated by long leaves and bristling with rough hairs, like those of the cactus. Wonderful! Magnificent! Splendid! cried my uncle. Here is the entire flora of the second period of the world, the transition period. These humble garden plants with us were tall trees in the early ages. Look, Axel, and admire it all. Never had botanists such a feast as this. You are right, my uncle. Providence seems to have preserved in this immense conservatory the antediluvian plants which the wisdom of the philosophers has so sagaciously put together again. It is a conservatory, Axel, but is it not also a menagerie? Surely not a menagerie? Yes, no doubt of it. Look at that dust under your feet. See the bones scattered on the ground. So there are, I cried, bones of extinct animals. I had rushed upon these remains formed of indestructible phosphates of lime, and without hesitation I named these monstrous bones, which lay scattered about like decayed trunks of trees. Here is the lower jaw of a mastodon, I said. These are the molar teeth of the Deinotherium. This femur must have belonged to the greatest of those beasts, the Megatherium. It certainly is a menagerie, for these remains were not brought here by a deluge. The animals to which they belonged roamed on the shores of this subterranean sea, under the shade of those arborescent trees. Here are entire skeletons, and yet I cannot understand the appearance of these quadrupeds in a granite cavern. Why? Because animal life existed upon the earth only in the secondary period, when a sediment of soil had been deposited by the rivers and taken the place of the incandescent rocks of the primitive period. Well, Axel... There is a very simple answer to your objection that this soil is alluvial. What? At such a depth below the surface of the earth? No doubt. And there is a geological explanation of the fact. At a certain period, the earth consisted only of an elastic crust or bark, alternately acted on by forces from above or below, according to the laws of attraction and gravitation. Probably there were subsidences of the outer crust, when a portion of the sedimentary deposits was carried down sudden openings. That may be, I replied. But if there have been creatures now extinct in these underground regions, why may not some of those monsters be now roaming through these gloomy forests, or hidden behind the steep crags? And as this unpleasant notion got hold of me, I surveyed with anxious scrutiny the open spaces before me. 
but no living creature appeared upon the barren strand. I felt rather tired, and went to sit down at the end of a promontory, at the foot of which the waves came and beat themselves into spray. Thence my eyes could sweep every part of the bay. Within its extremity a little harbor was formed between the pyramidal cliffs, where the still waters slept untouched by the boisterous winds. A brig and two or three schooners might have moored within it in safety. I almost fancied I should presently see some ship issue from it, full sail, and take to the open sea under the southern breeze. But this illusion lasted a very short time. We were the only living creatures in this subterranean world. When the wind lulled, a deeper silence than that of the deserts fell upon the arid naked rocks and weighed upon the surface of the ocean. I then desired to pierce the distant haze and to render asunder the mysterious curtain that hung across the horizon. Anxious queries arose to my lips. Where did that sea terminate? Where did it lead to? Should we ever know anything about its opposite shores? My uncle made no doubt about it all. I both desired and feared. After spending an hour in the contemplation of this marvelous spectacle, we returned to the shore to regain the grotto, and I fell asleep in the midst of the strangest thoughts. Chapter 31 Preparations for a Voyage of Discovery The next morning I awoke feeling perfectly well. I thought a bathe would do me good, and I went to plunge for a few minutes into the waters of this Mediterranean Sea for assuredly it better deserved this name than any other sea. I came back to breakfast with a good appetite. Hans was a good caterer for our little household. He had water and fire at his disposal, so that he was able to vary our bill of fare now and then. For dessert he gave us a few sips of coffee, and never was coffee so delicious. Now, said my uncle, now is the time for high tide and we must not lose the opportunity to study this phenomenon. What? The tide? I cried. Can the influence of the sun and moon be felt down here? Why not? Are not all bodies subjected throughout their mass to the power of universal attraction? This mass of water cannot escape the general law, and in spite of the heavy atmospheric pressure on the surface, you will see it rise like the Atlantic itself. At the same moment we reached the sand on the shore, and the waves were by slow degrees encroaching on the shore. Here is the tide rising, I cried. Yes, Axel, and judging by these ridges of foam, you may observe that the sea will rise about twelve feet. This is wonderful, I said. No, it is quite natural. You may say so, uncle, but to me it is most extraordinary, and I can hardly believe my eyes. Who would have ever imagined, under this terrestrial crust, an ocean with ebbing and flowing tides, with winds and storms? Well, replied my uncle, is there any scientific reason against it? No, I see none, as soon as the theory of central heat is given up. So then thus far, he answered, the theory of Sir Humphrey Davy is confirmed. Evidently it is and now there is no reason why there should not be seas and continents in the interior of the earth. No doubt, said my uncle, and inhabited too. To be sure, said I, and why should not these waters yield to us fishes of unknown species? At any rate, he replied, we have not seen any yet. Well, let us make some lines, and see if the bait will draw here as it does in sublunary regions. We will try, Axel for we must penetrate all secrets of these newly discovered regions. But where are we, uncle? For I have not yet asked you that question, and your instruments must be able to furnish the answer. Horizontally, three hundred and fifty leagues from Iceland. So much as that? I am sure of not being a mile out of my reckoning. And does the compass still show southeast? Yes, with a westerly deviation of nineteen degrees forty-five minutes, just as above ground. As for its dip, a curious fact is coming to light, which I have observed carefully, that the needle, instead of dipping towards the pole, as in the northern hemisphere, on the contrary, 
rises from it. Would you then conclude, I said, that the magnetic pole is somewhere between the surface of the globe and the point where we are? Exactly so, and it is likely enough that if we were to reach the spot beneath the polar regions, about that 71st degree where Sir James Ross had discovered the magnetic pole to be situated, we should see the needle point straight up. Therefore, that mysterious center of attraction is at no great depth. I remarked, it is so. And here is a fact which science has scarcely suspected. Science, my lad, has been built upon many errors, but they are errors which it was good to fall into, for they led to the truth. What depth have we now reached? We are thirty-five leagues below the surface. So, I said, examining the map, the highlands of Scotland are over our heads, and the Grampians are raising their rugged summits above us. Yes, answered the professor, laughing. It is rather a heavy weight to bear, but a solid arch spans over our heads. The great architect has built it of the best materials, and never could a man have given it so wide a stretch. What are the finest arches of bridges and the arcades of cathedrals compared with this far-reaching vault? with a radius of three leagues, beneath which a wide and tempest-tossed ocean may flow at its ease. Though I am not afraid that it will fall down upon my head. But now, what are your plans? Are you not thinking of returning to the surface now? Return? No, oh, indeed. We will continue our journey, everything having gone on well so far. But how are we to get down below this liquid surface? Oh, I am not going to dive head foremost. But if all oceans are, properly speaking, but lakes, since they are encompassed by land, of course this internal sea will be surrounded by a coast of granite, and on the opposite shores we shall find fresh passages opening. How long do you suppose this sea to be? Thirty or forty leagues, so that we have no time to lose, and we shall set sail tomorrow. I looked about for a ship. Set sail, shall we? but I should like to see my boat first. It will not be a boat at all, but a good well-made raft. Why, I said, a raft would be just as hard to make as a boat, and I don't see. I know you don't see, but you might hear if you would listen. Don't you hear the hammer at work? Hans is already building at it. What? Has he already felled the trees? Oh, the trees were already down. Come, and you will see for yourself. After half an hour's walking, on the other side of the promontory which formed the little natural harbour, I perceived Hans at work. In a few more steps I was at his side. To my great surprise, a half-finished raft was already lying on the sand, made of a peculiar kind of wood, and a great number of planks, straight and bent, and of frames were covering the ground, enough almost for a little fleet. Uncle, what wood is this? I cried. It is fir, pine, or birch and other northern coniferae, mineralized by the action of the sea. It is called Surter brand, a variety of brown coal, or lignite, found chiefly in Iceland. But surely then, like other fossil wood, it must be as hard as stone, and cannot float. Sometimes that may happen, some of these woods become true anthracites, but others, such as this, have only gone through the first stage of fossil transformation. Just look, added my uncle, throwing into the sea one of those precious waifs. The bit of wood, after disappearing, returned to the surface and oscillated to and fro with the waves. Are you convinced? said my uncle. I am quite convinced, although I think it is incredible. By next evening, thanks to the industry and skill of our guide, the raft was made. It was ten feet by five, the planks of Surter brand braced strongly together with cords, presented an even surface, and when launched this improvised vessel floated easily upon the waves of the Liedenbrock Sea. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of A Journey to the Center of the Earth, Part 6 of 9, by Jules Verne. If you've enjoyed this episode, please become a supporting member 
by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com and clicking the appropriate button. And thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me next time and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>